Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Building a Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Essif. Monsignor Essif is a priest of the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He has served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Mother Teresa. He continues to offer direction and retreats for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Monsignor Essif encountered St. Padre Pio, who became a spiritual father to him. He has lived in areas around the world, serving in the Pontifical Missions, a Catholic organization established by St. John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially the poor. He continues to serve as a retreat leader and director to bishops, priests, sisters, and seminarians, and other religious leaders. Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Good morning. Good morning, Monsignor. How are you? Happy commemoration of all souls. I was wondering if we say happy day. This is. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I would love to uh, rejoice the church's teaching on souls. We do call them poor souls, but our connection with them is very powerful and very happy. It's the happiness of the union that we have with them and they with us and they with heaven and their destiny being heaven for all eternity. I think there's a lot of uncertainty and un poor teaching, I think, on purgatory. I hope today can be a, some kind of clarification. Many recently that I'm aware of that feel that other than call them poor souls, they call them the holy souls in purgatory. Would you agree with that? I do. And expectant and longing. Yesterday, I sat down and I began remembering the souls that whose funerals I attended, maybe who whom I was connected with. And I wrote down between 125 and 175 names on a paper that I intend to put on the altar when I celebrate Mass today. And the Church, incidentally, gives every priest the privilege of offering three Masses for the poor souls. Because no matter what you pray, if you, if you pray the Rosary for a soul, especially if you pray it before the Blessed Sacrament, if you have intercession and prayers for souls— and ask that you know, an Our Father, Hail Mary and Glory Bees, for the release of their souls from purgatory. There's, there's some tremendous graces that can be gained for them today, especially. The Church is outpouring in her desire for us to commemorate, to think about, and to pray for the souls in purgatory. We don't know the particulars of the judgment that is passed on my mother, my father, my sister, and these names that I have here, the ones that I, that I know and have intimate connection with, I would like to th think of the word remember in a new way. We are the body of Christ. Did my father and mother and sister, were they dismembered? You know how when you lose a finger, or a thumb, or a hand, was I dismembered of that family member? If we remember, Jesus is the head. We are the body. When we remember, we take that soul. I've taken all these souls, and it was really a powerful experience for me as I reconnected, remembered, uh, the body of my family, my friends, my acquaintances, those that I wanted to pray for. And I had this wonderful, more complete image of the body. We are connected to them and they to us. Some of them that I um, have remembered here, 
died as suicides. A couple of them died in overdoses of drugs or in accidents. Some of them died in prison. Some of them just died in normal kinds of death and bad. And as I attended them and had their funerals. But I would like us to think about today on All Souls Day, the funerals that we attend. You see, when a person dies, we believe that the soul is separated from the body. And that moment that we call death occurs. Now, many times because of our modern way of looking at the body, that body really begins to decay. In the old ritual, we used to say the words, dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. Well, actually, when I was in places other than the United States, and I had become so used to embalming uh, in my first trip out of the country and my years in South America, that body actually begins to decay when it dies. Dust thou art. And so, realistically, when you think of death, it's that separation of the soul, which gives life to the body, and that body. So, that body, which is now beginning to decay, you know, in the embalming, when when you go to see an embalmed body, oh, doesn't he look good? You know, he's got a nice tan or whatever. He's dead. That soul that enliven that body, is now before God. At that point, we teach either is in heaven or in hell, or if that person is not perfect because none but the perfect enter into glory, they go to purgatory. I really believe we want to do some teaching about what it is to be in purgatory. What What is that state? My loved ones who have died, and this 125 to 175 people that I'm going to pray for today, by name, place them on the altar. I have made this list, and I'm remembering them. I have marvelous experience. Like, I can almost see their eyes looking at me and thanking me as I wrote their names down to pray for them. I was remembering them. They weren't so far from my thoughts as I was remembering them and thinking about them, where are they? What does the church teach about them? Well, they haven't had anything to eat. They're the souls. They don't eat. They don't drink. They have no sex. They don't sleep. Every bit of them is drawn to God for whom they were made. Every bit of the soul is made for God. And yet, since they are not yet united, how? Let's listen to what happens to the soul when it's baptized. I think the most important teaching with regard to all of us is what happens to our soul when we are baptized. St. Paul's letter to the Romans. I'll begin with the sixth chapter. This is the very famous teaching on baptism. Brothers and sisters, are you unaware that we who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a newness of life. For if we have grown into union with him, Through a death like his, we shall also be united with him in the resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that our sinful body might be done away with, that we might no longer be in slavery to sin, for a dead man has been absolved from sin. If then we have died with Christ, We believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has any power over him.
this instruction is what we have at every funeral mass. I, I would want this read at my own funeral because sometimes in the life of union with Jesus Christ, we fall out of union with Christ. How? Through our personal sin. What is the state of some of these people that I'm praying for? The one that I'm thinking of who killed himself, a relative of mine, should he have died at that time? There's another one that I have on my list as I remembered him. He died of a heart attack while pushing a car. And those who knew him, he had such a furious temper. His anger and his uncontrolled anger at things that went on around him. I don't know. I can't judge him. But that's when he died. Was he prepared to enter into the peace of God's glory? When I remembered him, I could experience in my heart the joy that I could pray for him. That is the marvel of today's feast. Those souls, we are one with them in the body of Christ. We are united. What is the union that we have on the other side? The life in Christ is a new life. It's the life of Jesus. It's the life of eternity. It's the life of truth. It's the life of that love that is heaven. It's the life of the Trinity into which we were baptized. It's the life that is going to endure forever. We were adopted by the Father in union with Jesus who loves the Father, and the Father loves him, and the power of that union is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the crowds, everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Because I came down from heaven to do the will of my Father, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And the will of the one who sent me is this, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. What a comforting thing at the Mass that we now commemorate. And some of these souls that I'm praying for, that they will hear that today, that they will be hopeful of gaining that everlasting life because he can never go back on his word. His word is truth. I have come to not lose anyone that the Father has sent to me. And surely these are the ones that have been sent to him. Today, we have a, a tremendous opportunity to pray and to hear the word. If you are a baptized Christian, and particularly if you're a baptized Catholic, when you come to be buried, when that separation takes place between your body and your soul, or what took place when your mother died, or when your sister died, or when your wife died, that soul is where? I really don't know. And that's why the church has this feast. Many of the souls that I knew were not perfect. You know, I think of, you know, my grandmother, I, I, I'm not her judge, but there were certain things that were very away from perfection and different things. But should she go to hell for those? Absolutely not. You know, where would be the kindness and the mercy of God? None but the perfect go to heaven. And so as we come to contemplate and to pray and to think about that this power that we have, prayer, that reaches the souls beyond the grave, the other dimension of that is they can pray for us. I think there's a joyfulness, but a kind of a solemnity, a reverence, 
a quietness, a reflectiveness, a prayerfulness. I would invite people all over the Catholic world today to enter into an inner prayer, interiority, to think about our baptism and our union with God. The Church reminds us at this Mass where we read from the Book of Wisdom, the souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead, and they're passing away from us affliction, and they're going forth utter destruction, but they are in peace. For if before men, indeed, they be punished, yet is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. In the time of their visitation, they shall shine and shall dart about like sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with his elect. They are going through trial. Dying is not easy. Dying has always been difficult. It goes with with the dying. But it's like gold that's being purified by the fire. If the gold could speak, it would hate the fire that burns it. Yet that's exactly what's happening to each of us as we go through trial and, and affliction. You see, that union that we have in our hearts with Jesus is that union that we have with him. He first... Jesus suffered and died and rose. The cross into which we were introduced in our baptism, we were introduced to the cross of Jesus Christ. We were signed with his cross. We are united with his cross. But then comes the resurrection. For every Christian, for every baptized soul, it ends in glory. We have a life of comedy, not tragedy. There is always, always the story of joy. For the Christian, life ends in glory because life is union with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ always triumphs over sin, over Satan, and over death. Jesus did that on the cross, buried and rose. That same Jesus is in your soul and in mine. He is the same Jesus in us through baptism, so that our story, like his, united with him, will be suffering, and then dying, and then rising. That same suffering and death and resurrection is taking place in me and in you. I apparently am having a a very nice day today, but still, It's the life of Jesus, union with him, that gives me my joy, my union. Some days I have sickness, some days I have pain, sometimes I have whatever that might be, and some days I have resurrection. But each of us has that Paschal mystery going on in each of us. It began when we were baptized, and it will only end in our final death, and then comes the resurrection. For the Christian, and for this day that we call All Souls Day, it is a a great joy. Monsignor, that fire that you spoke of, um, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, was talking about how the saints have been burned in the holy fire of the love of the Trinity, that fire of love between Jesus and the Father is one that kind of helps burn away, essentially, those things in us 
that bring us to the perfection it sounds as though you were just speaking of. I love the image of fire. And it really began for me with the Sacred Heart. When the Sacred Heart showed his heart to Margaret Mary, the feature of his heart that most attracted was the fire. You see, all of this, whether it be suffering, whether it be dying or rising, it's all fire. And the fire is the divine love. The love of the Father for the Son is fire. The love of the Son for the Father is fire. And the love that is the Holy Spirit is fire. And so the love of the Trinity is fire. And if you're not prepared to enter into that pure fire of divine love, then it has to be cleansed until the purification takes place. That's why it helps me to think about the soul that doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, doesn't drink, and nothing but God. The yearning and the longing and the burning for God. That yearning and burning and yearning is what introduces it into that divine fire. You are not prepared to enter God. It would be the worst hell in the world if the fire of love wasn't for you, especially if you if you were angry and hateful and resentful or whatever that might be that would prevent you from being caught into that fire. It's total otherness. And so if there's anything of self-centeredness within us, it prevents us from entering. And through the mercy of God, he prevents us from entering into the furnace of divine love. Because when you're in heaven, you totally are consumed by the love of God. And with everyone you see, you're going to be consumed by that love of one another. Will you know one another? You're going to love one another far more. And when I was going over these names, and I was going over, and the prayers I'm going to offer for them, I could see this little bit of, oh, you know, Lord, I, I'm, I'm giving this to him, but he was really nasty to me. So I had to cleanse my heart with some of them. And it was really wonderful to remember them and to rekindle in my heart a love for them and maybe, as some of them, their love for me. And I was feeling that with some of them also as I went over my list. I hope you have that same experience. Monsignor, when you were speaking about those people on the list that you're just not sure of, Again, Pope Francis was talking about how our hope is an anchor, that the early Christians used the symbol of an anchor, that it was grounded in that shore of Christ's love for us. And there are those who have been recently saying that we don't preach enough about hell, and yet it's a difficult balance between knowing when to preach about hell and knowing when to preach about that hope for not only our souls, but for the ones that we care about and pray for, as you just mentioned. See, the heart of Jesus, that anchor, is the heart of Jesus that's constantly pulling and drawing the soul. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. There's the anchor. Because even though you may draw away from me at times, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it up on the last day. It's his desire to save us, more than our desire to be saved. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. God sent me to draw you, to pull you, to take you with me to heaven. So, God draws, wants, yearns for, longs for. It's the soul itself. Did Judas reject it? Well, our Lord himself said, it would be better if this man had not been born. 
because he himself didn't want it, although I come down to save him. And I didn't want to lose anyone except the one who is the son of perdition. He chose to leave God. He chose to pull away. And damnation is for those, they, they have a choice. I think salvation is the desire that God has. Final thoughts, Monsignor? We are so afraid of the divine love, and there's nothing to be afraid of. Not to be afraid of dying, not to be afraid of the dead, that we have such a close affinity. And I encourage you now to make your list, and especially today, to take advantage of the outpouring that the church is giving us of prayers for the dead. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus. In union with the Masses said throughout the world today, for all the souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, for those in my home and in my family. Amen. You've been listening to Building a Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Essif. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essef. <music>